My name is Brian Kloss. I'm a board-certified emergency medicine physician. I'm assistant professor at SUNY Upstate Medical University, Syracuse, New York. I graduated from UB School of Law in 2007 and UMD and JSOM Osteopathic Medical School in 2008. Prior to medical school, I was an x-ray technologist as well as a physician assistant. I'm a fellowship trained in gastroenterology and liver disease as a physician assistant. I've been lecturing at regional, national, and state CME conferences for about 15 years now. I'm also a director of the SUNY Upstate Physician Assistant Fellowship in Emergency Medicine. One of the things I'm passionate about is teaching, and what I've done recently is I've combined the talents of myself and my colleague who's an illustrator, trying to combine comic book uh, illustration for medical education. So um, I put some flyers out there if you want to take a look at some of the artwork that we do as far as for teaching toxicology. I published a textbook called Toxicology in a Box with McGraw-Hill in 2013, and I'm currently writing my second textbook, which is on infectious disease to be published with El Elsevier in the next coming year. So on to the lecture. So this lecture is on synthetic drugs, synthetic drugs of abuse. This is a lecture and topic that I started talking about maybe seven, eight years ago. It was maybe five or 10 percent of what I talked about when I talked about substance abuse. Now I could get up here and give two, three, or four hours lecture just on synthetic drugs. Again, toxicology is something I'm interested in. You'll see a lot of the different cartoons that I use in my lecture. So my only request is you guys don't shoot the messenger. I might end up changing a lot of people's worldviews, uh, sharing with some information that is known to many people, but not to yourselves. So this information you might find a bit upsetting and uh, might change your perspective on certain realities. So don't get angry at me. Why do I lecture about substance abuse? I think this is an elephant in a room that really no one talks about. Uh, my role as a physician is an emergency room, so I'm sort of there on the forefront of things. I see the integration of society and medicine on a daily basis. When synthetic drugs first started to hit the market in Syracuse, we were the first ones to see us in the emergency room and started to recognize what these patterns were, report the information to the toxicology centers. Now we're seeing similar things as far as with heroin. Heroin's being cut with fentanyl, so we're seeing, again, another uh, rash of uh, opiate overdoses from the heroin, and uh, that's getting a lot of notoriety. When people talk about Molly, they're so insistent that it's pure MDMA, pure ecstasy. They say it's called Molly because Molly stands for molecule. Molly Cyrus loves Molly in one of her songs, the song We Can't Stop Dancing. She talks about dancing in a club with Molly. She says, you know, if you know her and what she's all about and you're an adult, you know that she's talking about using uh, MDMA or synthetic drugs. Uh, but if you're a child, you think she's saying, I'm dancing with Miley. With all these different synthetic drugs out there on the market, there's also, through the um, advent of what's called harm reduction, there's actually drug testing kits. So the internet makes it available for people to purchase testing kits to test whether the substances they're buying is cocaine, heroin, MDMA, MDA, MDEA, cathinones, bath salts. So these uh, drug testing kits can be purchased for anywhere from 10 to $20. This is what MDMA or ecstasy looked like back in the 1990s. What they had here was most likely or more likely to be true MDMA or ecstasy. The manufacturers would then take the time and effort to compress it into these small pills. The respective uh, symbol on a pill would give the end user a certain sense of security as to what the actual end product was. Uh, Mitsubishi was a very popular uh, brand that was known to have a high MDMA content. There are MDMA identification charts available. Um, these are more intended for um, law enforcement purposes only, but yet again through the advent of harm reduction, there's websites out there such as dancesafe.org that uh, will actually test MDMA pills or drug pills that you send to them and then post that information on the internet. The idea trying to be, you know, people are going to use these drugs, therefore they should make the people that are using them more aware of what it actually is that they're taking. So this goes back to 2006 and some of the chemicals in these pills include MDMA, which is known as ecstasy, MDA, which is Adam, MDEA, which is Eve, amphetamine, methamphetamines, caffeine with a cutting agent, and then ketamine, which is its own, you know, drug of abuse on its own. If you collect enough MDMA pills, you can make a nice uh, mural, artwork, very artistic. So getting back to Molly. So most people that are using the chemical Molly are pretty insistent that it's pure MDMA. They've uh, investigated when they confiscate what is being sold as Molly as to what's actually in there. 
and about 15% of what is confiscated as Mali is actually MDMA, which means that the 85% of what's being sold as Mali to the end user um, is completely something different. Uh, it was interesting growing up, not growing up in Syracuse, but being in Syracuse in 2010, 2011, we were actually one of the United States' largest uh, points of distribution of what was known at the time as Mali. Um, in 2011, they arrested 22 people. The investigations began as early as 2009. So this is when synthetic drugs were just really starting to emerge on the market. So Syracuse was one of the first places to see a tremendous amount of synthetic drugs. They arrested the individuals. They confiscated 100 kilograms of Mali, which was distributed between March of 2010 and 2011. So in Syracuse alone, 100 kilograms of the drug was distributed uh, over the course of one year. 25 kilograms of Mali was confiscated with a street value of half a million, 24 guns, four vehicles, a boat, and 100,000 in cash. And when they now confiscated the Mali, you can actually see what it was. Again, everyone's thinking it's pure MDMA, pure ecstasy. Turns out to be four MMC and four MEC. So it's four methyl methylmechcathinone and four methyl ethylcathinone. So these chemicals were actually bath salts. So people are so insistent that when they're doing Mali, it's pure MDMA they're more than likely using bath salts. And bath salts we'll talk about a little bit. Wesleyan University, who knows the, what happened here? Quick show of hands before today's lecture. Okay, so Wesleyan University, um, I guess it has this reputation as a party school. It's relatively small, liberal arts college, uh, New England, I think. Um, but in February 2015, 12 students were hospitalized, five were arrested. Of the 12 students, one or two almost died, and I believe four or five had to be intubated and kept on ventilators in the ICU for several days. Turns out that uh, about a year earlier, there was again mass overdoses, but this was previously unreported. So the only reason why this got reported was because the 12 students went to the hospital. So if 12 students went to the hospital, I'm sure there's probably another 10 or 12 that didn't. Here's the kids who were arrested. This is a very popular pose uh, when you get arrested as far as your mug shot. It's just kind of a sign of contempt, you know, with your chin up. Um, but here's Molly. So this is the powder that is being sold as pure MDMA, pure ecstasy. How much is this being sold for? Um, 0.1 grams, $20, 1 gram, $200. If you knew the guy, you could purchase maybe a gram for $80 to $100, and then you can sell it on yourself and double your investment there. Um, the five students were arrested, they were suspended from school, charges were dropped in two cases. So the question is, what was this chemical? Everyone was saying, well, it's Molly, pure MDMA, pure ecstasy. Well, it turns out in this case it was AB Fubinaca, which is a, sub a substance and a substance similar to MDMA, which was 6-MAPB. So AB Fubinaca is actually a very powerful uh, synthetic drug, which is actually along the lines of a synthetic marijuana. and the 6-MABP, or PB, is similar to MDMA, but again, not pure MDMA. The child or student that was actually selling the drugs had actually created pamphlets on how to use this drug safely and what the appropriate doses were, so uh, further evidence against him in a court of law. So what are these chemicals? So AB Fubinaca, this was invented by Pfizer in 2009. It hit the synthetic drug scene in 2012, first in Japan. It's got some other derivatives like AB Pinaka, 5F AB Pinaka, et cetera. It's a type of synthetic marijuana, and when we talk about synthetic marijuana, this isn't really synthetic um, delta-9 THC. These are what's essentially um, marijuana receptor analogs. So it turns out in the human brain and human body, there's actual receptors for the marijuana chemical. These are synthetic chemicals that hit those receptors, sometimes with a greater affinity than you know, natural marijuana actually does. The problem with AB Fubinaca is extremely toxic and has been associated with several deaths. And then the 6-APB chemical is also known as benzofury. It's a whole other class of synthetic drugs known as phenethylamines. And these phenethylamines are um, sort of stimulants, hallucinogenic stimulants that are in a class by themselves that um, work as triple monoamine reuptake inhibitors and also uh, serotonin 2B receptor agonists. So they're hallucinogenic as well as uh, stimulant in effect. And again, um, this phenethylamine many times is being sold as, again, molly. 
Now, to put things in perspective about how much drug dealing is actually going on on college campuses and how accessible you know, drugs are to students, um, in the city of Oswego, which is near where I live in Syracuse, and again, this lecture is more pertinent to people that are from my area, but there was a student, 21 years old, arrested with 809 tablets of Xanax um, and $170,000 cash, you know. So where did he get the $170,000 cash, you know, selling drugs? So it's, you know, quite profitable. That's more than I take home in a year. Um, he only had a $5,000 cash bail or $10,000 band. Um, Xanax, popular drug of abuse. They call them totem poles because it looks like a totem pole. You can break it into halves, quarters, thirds. Um, some of the colleges where I lecture at, Lemoyne is the college I lecture at, so again, it's got a population of about 2,800 students. Westland has about 3,000 students. This is where the 12 kids overdosed. And then Oswego is about 7,000 students. So on most all college campuses, there are you know, large quantities of drugs, many of which are synthetic drugs being bought and sold. And the question is, where are these drugs coming from? So Alibaba used to be a very good place to go to purchase synthetic drugs. Maybe four or five years ago, you could just type in synthetic marijuana, bath salts on Alibaba, and they would find for you a couple matches as companies that supply it, and you can order it by the kilogram, have it shipped to your house. Things have gotten a little bit harder, so what has happened now is there's something known as the dark webs. Quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with the dark web? Okay. So the dark web is sort of this underground internet that's not necessarily accessible through Google. Um, it's not really traceable by the FBI. It's a place where people trade child pornography. It's where people sell uh, weapons or uh, teach people how to make bombs as well as to uh, buy and sell synthetic drugs and other drugs. This is a famous website um, known as the Silk Road, which is actually sort of like an eBay website for the uh, dark webs. Um, you can see the variety of products purchased and for sale. It was sold using Bitcoin. The last time I looked at the value of Bitcoin, it was $419 for the U.S. dollar. So one Bitcoin was $419. So we missed that bandwagon for investing. But here you could purchase codeine and amphetamines and MDMA, marijuana, um, honeycomb wax, so 85% uh, THC, um, Moroccan hash, um, prescription drugs, um, heroin, uh, crystal meth, MDMA, um, marijuana, crystal meth, and all of these things were available for purchase. If you guys are interested in the dark web, there's an interesting uh, documentary about it. It was called Cyber Crimes with this guy Ben Hammersley, and it's available on Netflix, and it talks about the Silk Road. It was run by a character known as the Dread Pirate Roberts question is, did they arrest the correct Dread Pilot Roberts and who really is running the dark webs? So the Silk Road, as far as the website, is taken down, so you can't go home tonight and purchase any of these chemicals from the Silk Road. But rest assured, there are still other similar websites out there in full operation. So when I talked about synthetic drugs five, six years ago, we always talked about synthetic marijuana, then we talked about bath salts. Um, now, as the, more and more of these drugs are becoming available, I talk about what's called the new kids on the block. So the new kids on the block, we already covered Molly. So again, Molly, everyone thinks is pure MDMA, but it's unlikely that that's what it is. So about 85% of what's being sold as Molly is probably a uh, drug from another class like phenethylamine or what's called substituted cathinones. There's a new drug that's quite scary to me. It's 25B, NBOME. Um, also known as 25B or 25I. Then there's the phenethylamines. The two most common in that class is 2CI and 2CE. And then there's AB Fubinaca, which we talked about briefly, which is a very uh, powerful, deadly synthetic marijuana. 25B NBOME, also known as NBOM. This is in many ways being sold as an LSD alternative. Um, the issue here is that um, it's very um, similar to um, LSD in that it has a very strong affinity for the 5-HT2A receptor, and that's the receptor that the LSD hits. Um, it's uh, so powerful, it's 16 times stronger when it hits that receptor compared to this other chemical called uh, 2CI. And this drug itself is a substituted phenethylamine very similar to the others in the class, except again, the affinity for that receptor. It almost hits 100% uh, of all the 
5-HT2A receptors. So this is a chemical that does have some legitimate purpose. It's actually what's known as a research chemical, and that's how it's actually being purchased. So you can purchase this online over the internet, have it shipped to your house. It's a research chemical if you're doing like PET scans on monkeys and you tag this chemical, you can see where all the serotonin receptors are in that monkey's brain. Problem is, is that people and humans are consuming this drug. What it does when taken by a uh, individual is it'll cause tachycardia, dilated pupils, tremors. It'll cause a very high white count, lead to seizures, clonus, agitation, hallucinations, hypertension, acute kidney injury, metabolic acidosis. The thing that scares me about this drug is its potency. So it's so potent that it actually can be put on what's called blotter paper. So LSD uh, used to be one of the most potent uh, drugs out there as far as dosing in micrograms. Now there's this other chemical out there that can be used and sold as a mimic to LSD. Problem being it's, you know, much more toxic. Um, it can be taken sublingually, buccally, by the cheek, nasally, vaporized, shot IV, and this was responsible for 19 deaths in Americans between the age of 15 to 29, um, just between 2012-2013. This is LSD blotter paper. This is also able to be purchased. You can buy this on eBay. Um, when you purchase this on eBay, it's sold as blotter paper collector artwork. These are the Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and you can see the magic mushroom and they're running from the rain. But about $12 for that. What um, is it that these chemicals are doing to individuals when taken in high doses and even with what would be considered a therapeutic or recreational dose? Um, very similar to serotonin syndrome. So we'll see that we're hitting all the 5-HT2A receptors. Patient will come in perhaps confused, agitated, lethargic, uh, comatose. Autonomic instability is a key thing that we're seeing in many of the synthetic marijuanas as well now, including with the phenethylamines, is that patients will come in hyperthermic or tachycardic. Um, they might develop um, hypotension, bradycardia, and their entire autonomic regulation is out of whack. Um, this here um, is a picture of someone from serotonin syndrome overdose, hyperreflexia, cogwheeling in the lower extremities, bruxism, diaphoresis. The mnemonic here is wet dog shakes. Person will be shaking and tremulous, very diaphoretic. So that is all of the new synthetic drugs of abuse in a nutshell. We're going to talk now about some of the older ones, and this is where my lecture um, used to start two, three years ago. But I want to talk about what's known as K2 or spice. This is uh, incense and synthetic marijuana. Bath salts, which is a speedy or amphetamine type of drug, which is very similar to cocaine or uh, methamphetamine alternative. Plant food, which is a term more commonly used in the United Kingdom for a class of drugs, which are likely substituted cathinones or, you know, type of bath salt. But the effect is more what well, the user refers to as trippy, which is like ecstasy or MDMA compared to um, something more speedy like the um, bath salts as we know them. And then there's a few drugs that are legal that the DEA did not uh, schedule. This is because, uh, again, the world, I think, is getting smaller. So 20, 30 years ago, although these drugs existed, they were not really on the U.S. radar, and that includes salvia divinorum, which is a hallucinogenic uh, mint that's available for purchase on the Internet, uh, grows in Mexico, and then kratom, which is a uh, plant that comes from Southeast Asia. It's actually an opiate, so it's an opiate plant that grows up to 17 feet tall and uh, still uh, available for purchase, non-regulated. And then depending on how much time we have as far as for my lecture, sometimes my lectures go over, sometimes uh, they go a little bit slower than usual depending on you know, how quick I talk or the audience interest, I might be able to cover some of my other topics. So synthetic drugs is a little cartoon that kind of shows how many different synthetic drugs there are. Again, we talked about molly, which is white crystalline powder. Who really knows what it is? The phenethyl means like 2CI, 2CE packaged as pills. Um, plant food, uh, the incense, Mr. Nice Guy incense, um, K3 or K2, 
herbal Xanax. So there's even like a synthetic Xanax out there. It turns out it's actually temazepam, um, which is a uh, benzodiazepine type drug. But what they'll do is purchase temazepam in bulk and then package it as an herbal supplement similar to Xanax. Where did all these chemicals come from? They've actually been around for years, but in general, uh, we talk about them as research chemicals. They've been available for, for purchase in bulk uh, over the internet from Chinese manufacturers for years. These um, are being sold in a powder and then by bulk weight, so they're not packaged in pill form when they're being transported in the United States. So they're labeled not for human consumption. Um, it allows them to easily get through customs. Some of these chemicals themselves are manufacturing precursors to other chemicals that have psychoactive effects. So the chemical 2CH in and of itself is not psychoactive, but it can be converted to 2CI or 2CB. Some of these chemicals are pro-drugs, which means that they themselves are not drugs, but when consumed, they're converted to an active drug by the liver. One of those chemicals is called GBL, gamma butylactone. This is a solvent or a paint stripper. Uh, that's used for um, industrial purposes, but if drink by a capful, the body converts it to gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is a type of sedative. And then some of these chemicals are actually drugs themselves. So JWH018, MDVP, 4-methyl mechcathinone are all synthetic drugs that are being sold in research chemical format. And then some of these chemicals are actually drugs themselves that haven't been scheduled. So salvia and Kratom are actually plant-based uh, drugs that have an effect on the humans, but yet they're not FDA regulated. So going back to the history of uh, synthetic drugs availability, um, looking back, this is a gamma hydroxybutyrate home manufacturing kit. This is available online um, up until the early 1990s, so about the time I was getting out of high school, this was still available for purchase. Um, this is one liter of gamma butyl lactone, so that's that chemical I talked about as a solvent that they use to strip paint off of uh, walls and wax off of floors, and using a few chemical reagents, you're able to create gamma hydroxybutyrate. We don't see, or I don't see that much of it anymore, but this was very common in the 1990s. It was what was at one time referred to as one of the club drugs. It was sold in the back of High Times mag Magazine. This is Gamma G. These are the guys from the Jersey Shore. Um, and they're all like, yo, bro, we got some girls. We got some Gamma G. It's going to give ecstatic pleasure, exotic and seductive situations, extremely euphoric pleasure, hilarious, funny times. Um, this was the magazine from uh, 1998. So again, still available for purchase um, because it was being sold not as gamma hydroxybutyrate, but uh, gamma hydroxybutyrone. Um, where did synthetic marijuana actually come from and how did this all come to market? So back in the 1990s, the magazine High Times used to advertise something called Legal Buds. Um, it was a plant-like material, very similar to marijuana as far as its texture, consistency, point of vaporization when smoking. What had happened was someone got the bright idea of taking this plant material and then sprinkling actual synthetic marijuana on top of it. Now the plant material that's being sold as, you know, uh, marijuana actually, when smoked, has a very similar effect as marijuana. And the first chemical that was used for this purpose was JWH-018. This is a research chemical. Um, it was actually um, invented by someone from Clemson University, John W. Huffman, and what he was doing was research on the anandamide receptor for uh, the humans to see, okay, marijuana receptors, can we use it to increase appetite? Can we use it to decrease appetite? Can we use that receptor to treat pain? Um, what other things can we do if we hit that receptor? He patented the chemical JWH018, loaded it up onto the internet, and then you can use Google for a patent search. And then in China, they downloaded the patent and then started to manufacture this chemical. This chemical was then shipped around the world and then sprinkled onto this um, plant material and then packaged in this form here and sold predominantly. The uh, largest company that sells this product is known as Mr. Nice Guy. It's um, it's an allusion or a reference to a movie called Half Baked with Dave Chappelle, but Mr. Nice Guy was the brand of marijuana that they were selling in a movie. This chemical here actually causes catatonia. So I took this bag of marijuana from one of my patients that came in. They were handing this out for free at a local rock concert in Syracuse. 
Um, she came in going, oh, and I took the bag from her and put it in my pocket. I said, I'll use this for my research and my lectures, and I gave her some Ativan and then kept her for a few hours and sent her home. But since it induced catatonia, they said, hey, why don't we name it stuck? How many different options are there available for synthetic marijuanas? There are lots. So this is a picture from one of these smoke shops. Um, and again, if they are selling this anymore, it's not being sold necessarily over the counter. It's being sold what's known as under the counter. So you can't go and buy it over the counter. You have to actually just go in and ask for it, whereas before you could easily see it right, right there for your uh, you know, inspection. Lots and lots. Um, anytime you're selling any chemical that uh, brings in great amounts of revenue, you're going to need some guns to shoot people because, again, you're dealing with large volumes of cash. Dealing with large volumes of cash puts you at risk of getting robbed. So in Syracuse, it's interesting, I did a little investigative reporting and uh, said, let me go and investigate the smoke shop industry of Syracuse. I did my own little stakeout. This was Zonin's. This is the uh, only place that's still in business now, but this is the first one in business. It's an industrial part of town. No one knows that it's there unless they know that it's there, meaning that they go there specifically for its purpose. Um, it's not really in your face. It's you know near all the warehouses. And standing here, I would see cars pull in, cars pull out, cars pull in, cars pull out. So every five minutes or so, one or two cars would pull in, person would get out, go in a store, be back in her car within two or three minutes. So they weren't really browsing. They knew what they wanted to get in there. So they're likely selling synthetic marijuana in there, $25 a bag. But say the store was paying only $5, they're making a five-fold return on investment with customers coming in literally every two or three minutes. So this became a very popular business model for Syracuse. So they opened up Twisted Heads. Twisted Heads, this is on North Salina Street, so now we're seeing this coming from the industrial area into the more um, urban areas. So this is near all our various Italian restaurants and one of our, I guess, nicer neighborhoods if Syracuse has any of them. Um, so Twisted Heads uh, had both a North Salina Street location and a South Salina Street location. Then came Teb's. Teb's Head Shop actually opened up about three or four doors down from Twisted Heads, literally. Um, so it's sort of like a Starbucks opening right across the street from the Starbucks. You say, wait, are they going to, you know, drive each other out of business? No, they'll probably complement each other. Um, Tebbs was interesting. He's in prison now. Um, his operation was probably a bit too greedy. He um, purchased actual synthetic marijuana powders from China to a warehouse in Syracuse, then packaged them in that warehouse in Syracuse under his own brand, Tebbs Smoke and then sold Teb Smoke in Teb's head shop. He then lacked plausible deniability because he actually knew what the chemical was that was being put in the package and sold. He tried to cut out the middleman and go and um, make increased profits, but when he was arrested and the FBI investigated him, he wasn't able to say, well, I didn't really know what I was selling. The majority of people that were selling these chemicals uh, pretty much got off scot-free, or maybe they had to pay it. $200 fine, um, you know, for some violation, no criminal record. Um, there's been cases where uh, children have overdosed and the parents have gone into the various head shops with baseball bats and smashed up all the uh, inventory and uh, beat the uh, vendor and owner with a bat. And of course, they're the ones going to jail and fined for all the merchandise. But that's Teb's head shop. Then came the Datnola brand. It was 1.5 grams for $6, two for 10. So now we're starting to see saturation, marketplace saturation. This was Cloud Nine Smoke Shop. Um, right across the street was grand opening for 420 Emporium. And literally right across the street. And then finally, thank God, Knuckleheads opened in my neighborhood. So now instead of driving one mile, I could only drive a quarter mile. But this was the last one to open, first to close. Um, again, they got into the business too late. But it was very interesting because on the radio uh, stations in Syracuse, um, you know, music concerts were being sponsored by Teb's Head Shop. So, you know, the uh, local radio stations were taking essentially advertising dollars from drug dealers uh, promoting concerts. So for Halloween one year, we had Quiet Riot, popular band from the 80s come, it was sponsored by Teb's Head Shop and advertised on the radio. So, very interesting. So what is this synthetic marijuana all about? This is 
known as incense. The first two brands that ever hit the market was called K2 and Spice. So just as how the cassette player was called a Walkman, the thing for cleaning the ear was called a Q-tip, um, those things uh, are not really, you know, Walkman is a personal cassette recorder, it's a cotton swab. K2, Spice, these are brand names for what's known as a herbal incense blend. So um, the chemical that's sprinkled on top is technically a, um, you know, THC a receptor analog. It's not necessarily synthetic marijuana, but collectively we call these things synthetic marijuanas, incense, K2, Spice. I think that what had happened was they took legal buds and um, the herbal smoke from the early 2000s and 1990s sprinkled some of the synthetic marijuana chemicals upon it and then started selling it as a product that actually seemed to deliver. It was in 2008 that the folks in Germany were able to analyze some of these samples and uh, find out that yes, there is something being added to the synthetic marijuana um, that's not natural. And they were able to find the JWH uh, chemicals in there. John W. Huffman from Clemson University was the one that first made THC analogs in the late 1990s. As far as the different THC analogs that exist, there are literally thousands of them. JWH018, JWH073, um, cannabinol, cyclohexanol, HU210 are some of these compounds. Now there's even more and more compounds like AB Fubinaca, which unfortunately have higher toxicities. These are sold in head shops and smoke shops. And the thing that's scary about this is the concentration of the chemicals varies from one sachet to the next. So it might be the brand Mr. Nice Guy, might be the one with the fly on it that says stuck. You buy two bags of it from the same store, same date. One bag only has 0.2% of the chemicals in there, and then the other bag has about 3% of the chemicals. So when they were actually putting the synthetic marijuana powder on the plant material, they just ended up putting a lot extra here. So there was no regulation and there's a high degree of variation between each packet, even if it's the same chemical between the two packets. To make it even more complex, there are thousands of these chemicals, each one with various affinities for the anatomide or marijuana receptor, and that can vary between five to 800. So one chemical might actually be two, 300 times more potent than the other chemical. So what is it that the user expects? So if there's a drug that makes someone have a terrible experience every time they do it, they probably won't abuse that drug. So in the majority of the cases, when people smoke synthetic marijuana, they get the reaction that they're looking for. This one is a brand I came up with. I called it chilling out, feeling good, petting a rabbit, eating chips, watching TV. That's what the user expects. That tends to be what they get. However, truth in advertising, some actually cause panic. And patients become delusional and psychotic and paranoid. So they said, well, we'll call that brand panic. The one that seemed to endorse catatonia, they named it stuck. Space cadet might make you hallucinate and think you're being uh, tortured by aliens. And Jersey Shore, um, I don't know what that does. What do you get? Now this is synthetic marijuana and also natural marijuana can do these things. The higher potency uh, medical grade marijuanas might do these things. So what's happening, we're seeing an increase in the amount of adverse reactions to traditional marijuana in Colorado from recreational users that go there and either consume the cookies or the brownies with the marijuana in it and just flood the anatomide receptors or they smoke the 25% THC marijuana and have you know, uh, very adverse reactions because it's very potent. But with the synthetic marijuanas, what tends to happen is tachycardia, conjunctival injection, discoordination, dry mucous membranes, paranoia, hallucinations, delusions, altered time perception. The things that then start to get even worse include psychosis, tremors, seizures, agitation, catatonia. There's been cases of renal failure resulting from synthetic marijuanas. There's been 16-year-old uh, children having massive ST elevation MIs from synthetic marijuana. And when I first learned about the synthetic marijuanas and was researching them, you know, this case kind of, you know, bothered me as an 18-year-old in 2010. His name's David Rizoda. 
This is probably a normal kid, played in high school band and stuff, smoked the synthetic marijuana with some friends, had the idiosyncratic reaction, paranoid delusions, felt like he was actually in hell, goes home, gets a shotgun, and shoots himself in the head. We've talked about ST elevation MIs in children. Um, three teens uh, were seen at an ED in Utah, were clean cats, but had ST elevations uh, with troponins up to like 32. And in March 2012, renal failure, and I call these clusters. So there's so many different synthetic marijuana chemicals, there's so many synthetic drugs out there that they're being distributed in different parts of the country, different chemicals, different parts of the country. You might see these cluster phenomenons occurring. Why are these things so popular? Well, extremely profitable, both wholesale and retail. So gas stations uh, can buy a bag for five and sell it for 25. So it's a five-fold return on investment. Plus, on the wholesale end, you can buy a kilogram of the chemical for maybe $1,000 and sell it for $100,000. So 100-fold return on investment. Currently legal, or at least not illegal, still you know, depends. Uh, doesn't show up on conventional urine testing. They now have urine testing that actually looks for substituted caffeinones, which are the bath salts. They have them that look for some of the synthetic marijuana chains, et cetera. But that's more for forensic purposes. So that's for um, people that are on probation or parole. Convenience, perceived safety. Um, how do we treat people that come in uh, under the influence of synthetic marijuana? For the most part, it's just supportive care reassurance, calming techniques. If they have chest pain, arrhythmia, or any type of tachycardia, we get basically an EKG. Uh, consider getting a BMP, checking the renal function, plus or minus troponin. Um, benzodiazepine for anxiety, IV out of inner volume is very nice. Smooths them out and uh, they're good to go. I had a gentleman come in with chest pain, 55 years old, smoking synthetic marijuana with his son. You know, they were bonding. Um, he got chest pain and came in, and I did the full cardiac workup, gave him the Ativan, kept him for overnight in the ER, second troponin negative, sent him home. Comes back a month later, you know. So I'm like, all right, Ativan, and, uh, you know, I'll send you home. He's like, can I stay tonight? I said, no, we'll see you next month. All right, so what's new in Syracuse? Again, there are waves, and Syracuse got hit with a couple cluster phenomenons. Um, one of the synthetic marijuanas was causing cat catatonia and lethargy, so I had two case reports of that. Um, my colleague signs out a patient to me, goes, this guy's stinking drunk. And I go, okay, and he's been laying in the stretcher for six hours, not moving. <laughs> His alcohol was like 0.02, I guess, not really intoxicated, so I scanned his head and it's always maintained his own airway, so I sat on him myself for another eight hours and then woke up, so after being asleep for 15, 16 hours without us giving him anything to make him go to sleep, he admitted to smoking the green giant. I have another patient, his name is Craig, he comes in, normally he comes in and says, Rah! leg pain, and I say, Craig, no Vicodin for you, but I'll give you Tylenol, and he goes, Rah! Get out of here. Then he leaves. Today was different. He comes in and goes, ah, belly pain. I said, uh oh, belly pain, that's different. Get him in a stretcher and he goes, belly pain. And then he goes unconscious and his uh, you know, blood pressure drops to 80 <laughs> systolic and his heart rate is still normal at 50. And I'm like, I thought the heart rate's supposed to go up. But, um, you know, belly pain and hypotension, thinking AAA. You know, you have to do what you need to do. So, <clears throat> CTA of the abdomen and pelvis, all negative. Turns out synthetic marijuana causing this autonomic instability, hypotension, but without the tachycardia. Agitated delirium, this one's easy uh, to diagnose, but it's a safety risk. These are the patients that the police usually bring in and they're screaming and you know, very angry and belligerent. I usually give them Haldol, 10 milligrams IV, 50 of Benadryl, two of Ativan, and go from there. Um, if they get too out of control, you know, paralysis, sedation, intubation, how did you learn so much about the synthetic marijuanas, Dr. Kloss? Well, I read Bloomberg Business Week. This magazine basically gave me the entire detail of the operation, it's how to start your own business with the synthetic marijuanas. Alibaba.com is where years ago you could purchase the synthetic marijuana chemical. You can easily purchase any drug you want from China. You want synthetic powdered fentanyl, you want Remy fentanyl, all available from China. Um, so here for weight loss, one would naturally use uh, amphetamines. Um, for male enhancement, use powdered Cialis. And again, we talked about how powdered synthetic uh, marijuana can be used to make K2 or spice. 
We'll talk about uh, bath salts uh, for a bit. I think I have maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. So bath salts, so we now have this synthetic marijuana, but what if you're looking to get really crazy and want some sort of amphetamine or stimulant? Well, that's where bath salts came in. Um, as you can see by the way they're packaged, they're making this illusionary reference that it's a cocaine um, analog. Um, Ivory Snow, Cloud Nine, Tranquility, Say Hello to My Little Friend. Even Charlie Sheen had a brand out there. I don't know if he endorsed it, but he probably used it, you know, that Charlie. Um, so listen, how many options are there? Lots and lots of options. Um, what was one of the first bath salts? So again, these aren't bath salts. These aren't the kind you buy at Lush Cosmetics from Canada, all natural, and you know, it's what it is is they're saying it's a powdered chemical. We'll say it's a bath salt, but it's really an amphetamine. So what were the amphetamines that were in there? One of them was MDVP, methylene dioxypyrovalerone. Um, what this was was a drug from 1969 that is a norepinephrine dopamine receptor uptake inhibitor. It's known as Super Coke or Maddie. It's white to yellow in color, fishy odor with age. More of a stimulant effect than empathogeneric. Empathogeneric sort of like emotion, trippy, tactile hallucinations, I love you, you love me. Um, stimulant effect is, uh, you know, amphetamine. So this was more speedy and less trippy. Lasts for four to six hours, uh, or a four to six hour high with a come down for a total effect of 10 hours. Extremely addictive with a high desire to redose. People would have these psychotic reactions. There are stories about a woman throwing her baby out of the car while driving because she thought the baby was the devil. Um, the homeless guy attacking uh, the other gentleman and trying to bite his face off. Um, you know, agitated delirium. The drugs cause hypertension, tachycardia, bruxism, diaphoresis, madriasis, hyperthermia, rhabdomyolysis, paranoia, psychosis, delusions, hallucinations. When I first learned about this chemical, it's from the internet, there was a gentleman looking very similar to this character here who basically says, I use bath salts, don't use bath salts. And I said, all right, that's a good take home lesson. Um, here's a little cartoon from my um, you know, uh, teachings. I have all these little packets here with the side effects or signs and symptoms kind of illustrating all these packets, extremely addictive. Um, some of these act as substituted cathinones, so the MDVP is actually an amphetamine in its own right. And then there's these whole drugs called substituted cathinones, which are derivative of a plant called cot. And cot is from uh, Africa, and you chew it, it's probably like caffeine plus three. But they took that molecule, cathinone, from cot and started adding all these side chains to it. So some of the side chains make it more of a stimulant, others make it more of a hallucinogenic material. Again, I'm very sick with my sense of humor. It's faces, it's what's for dinner. It's in a reference to beef. All right, plant food. This in the United States might be known as Molly, okay? In the United Kingdom, they were selling the bath salts that caused people more empathogenic, more trippy, hallucinogenic effect. They were selling it as plant food. Um, this tended to be um, Methadrone, which is a, a chemical in and of its own right, and many times substituted cathinones. In um, Syracuse, what was being sold as molly, which probably would have been sold as plant food in the United Kingdom, um, was the 4-methylmethcathinone, which is a uh, type of bath salt, if you will, but one that causes more hallucinations because um, it hits dopamine and serotonin, where the other ones seem to hit dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, Again, in Syracuse, 22 people were arrested. I'll talk a little bit more, and then I'll take some questions. I think I have 10 minutes. Um, quick show of hands, how many people know Salvia Divinorum? Okay, so three of you, perfect, four. All right, um, this is actually a mint from Oaxacala, Mexico. It's a hallucinogenic mint. It's totally legal. It comes from this plant. They take the leaves, dry them out, process them, and then sell it as a bag, um, perhaps as some herbal supplement. What happens is that this is smoked in sort of a water bong or water pipe. Um, and what happens is the user then feels as if they're uh, turning from a third dimensional being into a flat two dimensional being like a piece of paper or perhaps the paint on the dresser as they're transported into a parallel universe where plants, animals, aliens all live in harmony and it lasts for three to five minutes and then they come right back to reality. 
then they say, I'm never gonna do that again. So it's got a low potential for abuse. Um, in some of my lectures, and if you go to YouTube and type in Salvia fails, they have all these you know, YouTube things, fails means it wasn't a good experience. But you can see some of the users. One of the YouTube videos that scared me the most was a couple kids, 17 year old kids, one smoking Salvia, causes this disorientation while hallucinating, and gets up, starts running, and then you could see traffic going by in the background. So it could have easily been that he would have been hit by the car while under this effect. So this drug lasts for only three to five minutes, but it causes profound hallucinations, tactile hallucinations. People feel like there's millions of hands grabbing them. It's unique because it's only a kappa opiate agonist. So it's the only drug that hits specifically only the kappa opiate receptors. So since it doesn't hit the mu opiate receptors, it doesn't cause respiratory depression. It's sold for $20 to $30 per bag as an extract online and in smoke shops. It causes this earthy, trance-like dissociative high for five to 10 minutes. People often state they have a sense of familiarity with the drug. It's reported that Molly Cyrus was smoking it on her 18th birthday, but then her publicist said, well, you know, were you smoking marijuana or salvia? They couldn't get their story straight. But by her 19th birthday, I think it was really marijuana she was smoking because she you know, says that she loves Bob Marley. All right, Kratom, this is an 18 foot tall tree that grows opiate leaves. So Kratom uh, is a leaf off this plant, Southeast Asia. Um, this is Captain Kratom. This is an herbal supplement, uh, 15 grams Thai capsules. Captain Amsterdam picks the Kratom specifically for you and packages it for you. What's in there is um, psychoactive alkaloid 7 hydroxyoxy jitramyrene and mitragyrine. Um, these are alkaloids that have an agonistic effect at opioid receptors and as well at alpha adrenergic receptors at low doses. So it's almost like uh, an opiate stimulant, like a mini speedball. Um, limited effect on respiratory drive, making it relatively safe. Um, it's from Southeast Asia and is used uh, to mediate the severity of heroin withdrawal. I had a heroin addict come in recently and uh, was screaming. They locked him in a room. It wasn't my patient, but I saw he had a bottle of Kratom with him. So where's the danger of Kratom? Well, if it's an opiate-like drug and you want your brand of Kratom to be the best, what are you going to put in there? More opiates. So in Sweden, there was about 19 deaths from uh, Krypton Kratom because it was laced with O- desmethyl tramadol, which is the active metabolite of tramadol. And again, you can purchase that in bulk from China. You can also purchase um, fentanyl in bulk from China and use it to cut your heroin, increase profits. Um, so again, um, it wasn't necessarily perhaps Kratom that killed them, but the adulterants. Again, as an unregulated industry, it can be quite dangerous. Um, this is a cartoon of someone on the Kratom. Hyperthermia, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. It's a stimulant at low doses, maybe calming at high doses. It hits more of the opiate receptors. Um, can cause some mild hallucinations. So quick synthetic drug summary, K2 spice incense. Those are synthetic marijuanas. Bath salts, glass cleaners, another term that uh, bath salts are being sold as in Syracuse. Those are amphetamine-like. Molly or plant food, those are likely substituted cathinones phenethylamines or MDMA-like chemicals. The 25-NBOME is being sold as an LSD-like chemical, and Ancretom is, although a natural plant, not a synthetic drug, is being sold as an opiate-like chemical. If you guys are interested in interesting websites, um, arrowid.com is actually a resource that some of our toxicologists use. Um, users will smoke you know, hashish and then log on and write about all their experiences. Any drug, so when someone comes in and little girl says, I've been taking triple C's, I was like, triple C's? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Let's go to Arrowwood. So triple C's is uh, chlorocetin, cough and cold. So basically dextromethorphan. Um, oh, streetrx.com, are you overpaying for your prescription narcotics when you buy them from your friends? Um, you can log on to see what the prevailing price is for oxycodone, Vicodin, amphetamines, Percocets in the various region. This opiophile.com has been replaced by blue light. The thought here is harm reduction. 
but logging onto opiofile.com, they have recipes on how to extract all the fentanyl out of your used fentanyl patches. Basically, it's 85% isopropyl alcohol, and then you decant the alcohol. Um, but again, these are sophisticated people. The drug abuse in this country is huge. If you're interested in, in my teaching style, if any of you are affiliated with any of the medical schools and think I might be good to come out to the uh, schools, or if you're you know, an educator yourself, you can get a hold of me on my website, my email address. Levamisol, who's heard of Levamisol? Hmm, few of us. This is actually in our cocaine supply, so levamisole is a cutting agent. It's used to kill worms in cows, but yet it's in our cocaine supply. 75% of all U.S. cocaine supply has levamisole in it, so if you're using cocaine, you're using levamisole. Um, I was talking with some folks earlier. I met a woman when I was in prison. I was working in prison. wasn't there myself. Um, <laughs> She told me that she used to inject crack cocaine, but before injecting crack, she had to mix it with lemon juice or vinegar. I was like, well, why would you do that? And basically, she schooled me in basic chemistry. It's the old henderson hasselbalch equation. Basically, crack cocaine is a free base, and if you mix it with a weak acid, then that protonates the free base, and it makes it an ion, and absorbed through the bloodstream compared to the free base, which is nonpolar, which is better absorbed, or polar, which is better absorbed by smoking. I said, oh, thank you. So again, street pharmacists, um, so these people are sophisticated. If you've ever seen these at the gas station, these are what? Crack stems and crack pipes. I did get one for my girlfriend for, for thanks, uh, you know, Valentine's Day, you know. Yeah, she loves me. Um, Janssen Pharmaceuticals uh, created Levamisol. But again, 75% of our cocaine is cut with it. So what's the problem there? Uh, and why is it there? First, is it a bulking agent? Is it a stimulant in its own right? Or is it helping pass cocaine purity tests? Who knows? But it can cause vasculitis. So I had patients come in with vasculitis, white blood cell count of zero, neutropenic bone marrow, um, white count zero, neutrophil zero, white count, red count, and platelets are normal. I was like, this is like full-blown AIDS. I don't know the immune system, but, you know, ER guy, but HIV was negative, UDS positive for cocaine. Some people that are taking levamisole, idiosyncreatic, will cause massive reduction of the neutrophils. And I lecture on inhalants. That's a whole nother lecture. Dexamethorphan, over-the-counter, cough syrup taken in high doses is a dissociative anesthetic. Um, Cezerp, this is not the cough medicine with dextromethorphan in it, but this is the codeine and promethazine. It's very popular in what's known as the Dirty South, if you like rap music. And they mix it with 7-Up and a you know, little Jolly Rancher, and they call it a uh, lean. And they have songs about it. Chloracetin, cough and cold, triple Cs. So some adolescents are abusing this, uh, antihistamine, but the dexamethorphan is what they're after. In Russia, there's a very poor supply of heroin, and then that's actually like a, a, a problem for public health because think about what would happen if in America we immediately cut off the entire supply of heroin. It would be crazy. So in Russia, they take codeine, which was available over the counter, mix, mix it with match heads as well as uh, lighter fluid, and then it creates a new type of higher potency narcotic that they inject. The problem is it causes massive tissue ischemia, and you can see pictures of people on YouTube where their meat is actually sliding off their arm because um, they're using crocodile. Yes? Do you feel that the uh, grassroots movement, pardon the pun, of legalization of marijuana is going to stem the tide of all these bath salts and other illegal hallucinogens? It's a loaded question. It's a political issue. Um, you know, I think that uh, people are going to use marijuana no matter what. I think that the synthetic marijuanas were being used heavily by people in the armed forces because it uh, allows a bypass. It doesn't show up on drug testing. Uh, it might be an accessibility issue. I think if marijuana was perhaps taxed and regulated and then all that money was then used for treatment of harder drugs, it might be beneficial. I don't think we're winning this war on drugs. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, I don't know. I think people are going to do what they're going to do. Um, if we made it safer for them, harm reduction, it might be beneficial, but it's, 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 it's a complex issue that has numerous variables. You know, maybe we need drugs to be illegal so we can incarcerate people to run the, you know, prison industrial complex and employ law enforcement, you know, to keep our economy going. You know, it's complex. It is, it's a multi-billion dollar industry with involvement in many different parties across all, you know, affiliations in order to have the drug issues we have in this country.
Yeah. Can, you, can you comment on vaping and oh. popcorn lung? I, on pop, popcorn lung? What? It's bronchiolitis, al uh, bronchiolitis al uh, obliterans. Oh, like a boop. Um, I know with vaping, there's been a few cases of lipid pneumonia. Um, I do a whole lecture on vaping and how, you know, e-cigarettes came to be. Um, but, um, you know, the thought is, is the chemicals in the uh, e-cigarette solutions causing pneumonitis. Where do we stand on e-cigarettes? Is it safer than traditional cigarettes? You know, I think time will tell. Um, you know, I don't ever think it'll become FDA regulated, but we'll, we'll see. So, yes. Since NPR talked about um, powdered alcohol, I haven't heard anything about it. Oh, powdered alcohol, alcohol, yeah. Um, so powdered alcohol, um, they're trying to make illegal in many states. The thought is, is that powdered alcohol should be legal so you can carry a sachet of alcohol as a powder in your bag and take it on the airplane and then put it in your drink so you can drink alcohol and go through security, bring it to concerts, bring it with picnics, make fish tacos and sprinkle margarita flavored powder alcohol in there and get drunk eating fish tacos. Um, you know, the question is, do we really need another, you know, source of alcohol? Um, people have taken powdered alcohol and they've sniffed it. It's not really that good. Uh, burns the nose. Um, probably better just to drink the alcohol. But, yeah, so there is a chemical called powdered alcohol, the brand name Palcohol, that they're working on bringing to market for the purposes of ease of travel. So I think it's, a, you know, uh, you know uh, engineering genius to be able to take what we always thought of as a liquid and make it a powder. But, you know, I don't necessarily think we'll see much of that.